Thanksgiving. Welcome to our session, Balancing Convenience with Rigor, Finding Support Structures that Promote, promote Learning in Online Courses. In this ses session, Dr. Anita Ede will share research data gathered from three of her online courses in which pre-service teachers were asked to identify what support structures, structures assisted their online learning and those that did not. Dr. Ede teaches undergraduate. undergraduate. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. E teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in early childhood education at Northeastern State University. Prior to teaching at NSU, she taught children in early childhood settings. Classroom management and promoting resilience in a classroom environment are areas of particular interest, and she's presented at numerous childhood uh, conferences, and also published numerous articles. Her current research interest focuses on how to improve online education for early childhood students. I have a granddaughter that's four going into pre-K, so this session is really of interest to me. Thank you, Dr. Ede, whenever you're ready to go. I am ready to go. Welcome to this session. I'm glad to see so many people interested in online education. Um, I'm just a I'm going to throw this out to the group. Um, how many of you teach online? Raise your hand. Put up a hand. Nobody? Oh, I bet a lot of you do. I, I do. I see some now. Okay, I see some people teaching online. Well, this semester has been, um, oh, there we go. I see more of you now. Fantastic. Okay. Um, just throwing this out, what are some concerns that you have about teaching online? Just give, give a concern. Like I always tell my students, I have lots of time. I can wait. Making personal connections. Aha, uh -huh. that's a very valid concern. Any other concerns? Building relationships with my students. Okay. All right. Preventing cheating. What was that? I'm sorry. Preventing cheating. Ah, cheating. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's a big one. <laughs> okay. There's Anything a few, else? There's what a few in the chat. You've got a few in the chat. And I've got a few here. in the chat. Let's take a thank you for reminding me. I'm terrible about looking at chat. I could share that with you. Procrastination. Wow, that's a big one. Isolation. Are they really getting it? I'm sorry, Michael. Go ahead. No, no. Again, in just in time, I'm saying I'm finally find one door. They didn't come till about almost seven. Even the Chinese guy must go and they go get them. Because they're coming out and they go and was like. I didn't get that. Right back down that side, so you go get. I them. think someone is not muted. Oh, that okay. rain came down. I tell them, "Till they find that door, I'll still be Okay. Right well, I see rigor is a big concern. <laughs> Cheating is a big concern. Yeah, <laughs> no. If if you are not offering, could you please um mute? Thank you. That way we can all hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I see you have pretty much the same issues that I had going into this. Now, I have to be honest, I've taught online for um, a, quite a few years. It's been about five years now that our graduate program in early childhood education has gone completely online. So I've, I have had that time, but this is my first semester, spring of 2023, to see what undergraduate students experience in a strictly online format because it's the first time that our university has attempted to teach undergraduate early childhood education students in online classes. Before we begin, I'd like to ask somebody, tell me, can you see the PowerPoint? I can, yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. I, I, it makes me feel better. So that is why my, my study this semester came, came about. You know, I know online's really convenient, but you know what? Is there some rigor in this? And do you feel supported uh, by me, your instructor, when I'm teaching online? So that was the reason for this particular study. So, you know, why go online? I mean, we know students, um, when they responded, to the study said that the learning was more personalized because some of them had learning styles that did not jive with being in a classroom and sitting in front of other students. 
and in front of me, they felt more comfortable learning at home. Uh, the most common response was the flexible schedule, work pace, work um, hours, family needs. Health issues kept some people from being completely online. And teacher-student communication. Um, th these are all, these four are the biggies when you look on, you know, online at all the studies that all the students have filled out why they want to go online. Um, Teacher-student communication is interesting to me because I assume teacher-student communication would be poor. Oh, oh, and I noticed some of you also mentioned that as a concern. Am I going to be able to establish a relationship with these students? Um, because it's different from being face to face with a student. So I went on. Some of the research that NCES um, has put out, and this is not very recent in my opinion, because this comes from the fall of 2020. Um, the the predominance of undergraduates taking online classes is obvious. When you look at public universities here, the, the purple, you've got 70% taking at least one online class. You've got 48% exclusively in online programs, and this is at public universities. So that tells us a lot about what the trend is and, and where we as faculty and administrators perhaps need to go because things, things are not going to go back to the way they were. They are just going to increase um, in the online needs. Okay, so here's the big change for me. Uh, these are the three undergraduate classes that I taught this semester. Um, cognitive development, organization and implementation of early childhood course classes and classroom management. All three are very hands-on kinds of classes that in the past had required a lot of um, demonstration and modeling and explanation. Um, they're learning how to write lesson plans. They're learning how to create thematic units. They're learning how to create things for their classroom of the future. And boy, I was really worried about being able to do this in an online format for the undergraduates. So here we go. I surveyed them the week after spring break because I wanted to give them that time from January forward to experience the online environment. So they did have several months to experience it. And I said, what teaching strategies, videos, links, supplemental materials supported your learning? Because I wasn't sure what was helping them learn in these online classes. So the next one, what additional teaching strategies would have been helpful to your learning? Because I really felt like I could learn from them. Um, in what would help them learn better in the future. What procedures in this course supported your learning? I hope you're not having difficulty hearing me. I can always talk louder, but outside my window, someone has decided they all the hedges and bushes need trimming and they have a power tool doing that. Uh, and it's loud. <laughs> You're sounding fine. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay, number four, what additional or different procedures in this course would be more supportive of your learning? I, I really wanted to learn what helped them learn. And what assignments in this course supported your learning? Because, you know, I had to really alter some of the assignments to, um, to fit into this format. Okay, here we go. The first one, what teaching strategies in the course supported your learning? 94% of the respondents felt that the videos supported their learning. One commented, I'm a visual learner personally. What I decided to do was create a series of videos every week and post them on their announcement page on Blackboard where I had all their stuff. And in that I would go over what they were going to learn that week and 
I, I made them quite lengthy, um, sometimes as long as 50 minutes. That was probably my longest one. I would often include a PowerPoint and talk my way through that. And then I would talk about how to do an assignment. And, and I felt like I was covering things really well. It didn't work out quite that way, though. <laughs> because when I went back, and I can check and see how, how, how many watched the video and for how long. <laughs> I noticed that my long videos were not being watched. In fact, they might watch five minutes and that was that. So I, I came to a, a few conclusions at, and I'll talk my way through that a little bit later. But even though they said the videos supported their learning, this was certainly they didn't watch them completely. Individual Zoom meetings. I had a lot of individual Zoom meetings. Every time a student would email me with a question, if it wasn't something cut and dried, yes or no, I would say, "Let's. can you meet right now? I'm, I'm, I'm on Zoom. Here I am. Let's come into my Zoom office. And we would just meet instantly. narrated PowerPoints because they could re-watch the videos as much as needed throughout the week. That Those are all quotes. <clears throat> and if they were in my classroom, they couldn't re-hear me talk through a PowerPoint, even though I would post the PowerPoints on Blackboard. Um, they still wouldn't, wouldn't have all the examples that I would offer in a narration. Uh, they felt like it gave them a little bit more of a traditional environment when they listen to the videos. <clears throat> and they like examples. They love, you know, I tried to post an example of, well, here is what this assignment should look like. Um, not, not enough that they could literally copy, but certainly a format for them to fill out. And here's what a typical page on Blackboard looks like for me. When they open it up, they have my welcome message of the week. It's three and a half minutes. And the, uh, the chapter they're supposed to read. And then there's the narrated PowerPoint, which is all of eight minutes. I learned that when I break it up, they, they watch the whole thing. And that way, if they don't want to hear the welcome message every time they go back to the PowerPoint, they don't have to. It's all in specific little chunks. And then I put reminders on what's due. Everything here will be bolded by what is due quizzes. Um, I, I put a brochure here just in case someone wasn't quite clear what a brochure was. <laughs> There's a visual. And then I... I try to put links to additional information. I mean, I when I first started out this process of teaching online, I was under the mistaken impression that my students were digital natives and boy, if they needed to know something, they would just go on the internet and find all kinds of resources. Well, I was really sadly mistaken. And I found out that my undergraduate students were, were not really, really that savvy in finding resources. So as the semester progressed, I became better at providing resources for them. So every time I introduce a topic that's new and unusual, I add to the reading material with resources from the internet. And if anyone has anything to throw in and add to this, please do. We're real relaxed here. And if you have a question, please ask. Well, I just. I have a question. Uh, well, go, ahead. go ahead, Jay. I, I was just going to say, I put it in the chat so that everybody would see it. Um, as you can hear, my microphone is really good. Uh, I was just going to point out that uh, you should try and use a good quality microphone when you're doing those PowerPoint narrations, primarily because of the fact that they're probably going to be listening to it on their phone. And this will help tremendously with the audio quality on their phones. That That's all I was going to say. That's a good point. Thank you. Yes. And someone else was going to say something. I heard a voice. 
Yes, I was just going to ask how because I use um, I use additional resources too for my students, some YouTube videos and different websites that I might. But how do you balance the um, hey, this would be useful and this is entirely overwhelming? <laughs> That's a very good question. And I'm not sure I'm at that point yet. I'm not sure I'm a good judge. <laughs> I think sometimes I do overwhelm them with resources. But, you know, I think, you know, the more the merrier when it comes. They don't have to click on them all. I always tell them these resources are optional. If you don't want to look at them, that's fine with me. But they're here if you need them. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. That's a good point. So what additional teaching strategies would have been helpful to your learning? I was really curious to see what else maybe other teachers had done that I hadn't thought of. So they said more pictures, which is why I try to put an example. You know, if I, if I want a brochure, I put a brochure. This is what it looks like. Um, more links to resources. Some kind of journal writing for accountability in the readings. I guess a student thought I was not holding them accountable for the readings. They, they must not have realized that the, the chapter quiz they took every week was totally on the readings. So um, I'm not sure that I, I would want them to do more journal writing, um, even though that's good for accountability but I, I didn't want to overwhelm them with weekly assignments either. If they're going to have a quiz every week, they don't need that. Um, getting together on campus to meet several times during the semester would have been helpful to talk. With. Well, and I agree, I would have loved that, but I'm not allowed to schedule um, synchronous meetings that have to be attended. Now, I do have voluntary synchronous meetings that I... I just offer sometimes in the evening, especially if they have a big assignment scheduled in the near future. Um, I just put it on their Blackboard announcement page. I'm having an open house, uh, Zoom. You can come and go just to ask questions and visit. Um, and I usually get about a fourth of the class when I do that. Um, but I sure wouldn't do that on campus. For one thing, I have students um, not just in other cities, I have students um, in other states. And some of them are not in the same time zone as we are here at NSU. So I'm really hesitant to schedule anything synchronous um, on campus. But it's, it's a good thought. I mean, I would have liked to have seen them too. Um, opportunities for synchronous Zoom meetings, and, and we did, we had those. Um, once I saw that, I, I scheduled um, several of them um, in the subsequent weeks in each one of those classes. So I implemented that right away. And specific feedback on the graded rubrics as to what was missed. Well, and I'll show you what they're talking about. This is what a typical rubric, and I have a rubric in the syllabus for every assignment. Um, this is what it looks like. And, and I was just highlighting the, the positives that I found. So... In, in my head, I thought I was being really clear because if it wasn't highlighted, then they had not accomplished it. And of course, it's reflected in the grade. But I think I can improve on that by, by actually adding a note to the top of this rubric or the bottom of the rubric when I post it in their Blackboard grade book. Um, to make it more specific, maybe as I don't know, write it out, whatever was missed. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? This is Lisa from Southwestern. We have a nursing department. They do that regularly on their rubrics. And I really think it helps the students too, because um, you know, it's detailed, it's focused on them. And they really appreciate that. They talk about that on their evaluations. So, you know, rubrics are great too, but then they also get that individual feedback. Okay, so is that added just as a, as a small narrative at the top or the bottom of the mm -hmm. assignment? Yeah, the instructors will usually put their name, the date, 
and then they'll list it on there for them. And it doesn't have to be very long mm -hmm. because, you know, like you say, students don't like to watch long videos. Probably same thing with reading messages. Yeah. <laughs> it's very short, concise, and I, I, they really like it. Good to know. Good to know. I will do that from, from now on. Okay. And then I did send email nags and I do little nags because I tell them nag, nag, nag. This is due. Um, because I know that sometimes when you're not coming to the classroom regularly, maybe um, this this class might be on the back burner. So I did send email nags. Okay, what procedures in the course supported your learning? Well, feedback on assignments. Some thought the feedback was just fine. Uh, Zoom check-in sessions, which we, we had. All, listing all due dates, assignments, and where to turn them in. The modules labeled with the week of the class, and I did do that. The 11.59 p.m. Sunday due dates. I know that's a crazy time. You probably think I'm, I'm crazy doing this, but there's a method to my madness. Most of my students work full-time Monday through Friday. And so for some of these, the only time they have to work on their schoolwork is Saturday and Sunday. So everything, every new module opens up on Monday at, at um, 6 a.m. And that's not everything, but the announcement page with my little individual videos opens up at that time. The rest of the materials, the learning materials and the quizzes are all available from day one. Um, but those due dates are, are just so they have all weekend to work. Um, instructional videos help them learn. Due date, we don't want to like to be nagged at. And announcements that include everything needed for the week, videos, links, examples, and due dates. And this is what, um, what their calendar looks like in their syllabus for the whole semester. They've got this calendar where they've got the, the week, the date that the new module will appear, of course, and then the learning module, what's, what they have to do, their assignment for that week, and where to find and turn in their assignment. So I think that should be pretty clear. What additional or different procedures in this course would be more supportive? I was really interested. What can I do to improve? 18% suggested class meetings, and I did implement those. 27% suggested better feedback, and I do plan on doing that. I, I need to do better at that. And 27% said nothing else was needed. I can hardly believe that. What assignments in this course supported your learning? This was my big concern because these are hands-on classes. So 30% mentioned creating the pre-K through third grade video assignments. And I'm just gonna flip to the next page for this. This is what they looked like in the cognitive development where they're learning how to plan activities in the content areas for children. And my concern was that I used to have them plan the activity, and then teach us as if we were pre-K, first grade, kindergarten, so on and so forth, all the way up to third grade. And they wouldn't be able to do that anymore. We wouldn't be part of that lesson, and I wouldn't be able to watch them teach the lesson. So what I did was I created it so that they video themselves teaching that lesson, um, and they get extra points for including children. And then um, they write an activity reflection on how that lesson went. Um, and so evidently they really did like that act that format and I liked being able to see them do it. Okay, then 30% mentioned creating the classroom time schedule. And this is something they used to do in class and they used to make a time schedule for their own classroom um, because time schedules are very important classroom management tool. This is for the classroom management class. Children need to know what comes next. It gives them that feeling of, you know, I'm not anxious about what I do next. So they actually created it and then created a video and they talked all their way and showed off their time schedule. And that was one of their favorite assignments, turns out. Um, I'm going to give you a time warning. It's about uh -oh. five more minutes. Oh, how many more? 
about five. If you're okay, I'll talk Eleven thirty. Okay. Okay. Twelve percent mentioned designing a classroom web page, uh, which I have all my students design in classroom management. Design their own classroom web page on which they give what's happening in their classroom, how parents can interact with their children to, pr- you know, promote what's happening in the classroom, so on and so forth. They like that. Some like writing lesson plans, some like the content quizzes, and some like the ethics analysis. So just moving through. How, and then I said at the very end, how do you feel about online learning? And 10% did not like it. 26% said it was a means to an end, and 64% liked it or loved it. So I thought that was pretty much a sign of the times. And just some comments. You can just read through those on your own. You don't need me to uh, read through those for you. Lessons learned. Just a few lessons. Keep those videos short. Five minutes or under is the best. Uh, separate out videos for specific assignments, how to write a lesson plan introduction, how to write a lesson plan guided practice, make it short to the point, and you'll get students to watch, informal synchronous Zooms, um, email announcements, nag, 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 feedback on assignments, and demo videos. I'm going to start doing that. How to submit an assignment to Blackboard. How to submit your video to YouTube. Because that's the easiest way to to share your your video link. And those are lessons that I learned sometimes painfully this semester. And then next semester, I'm going to do a tutorial scavenger hunt for my students. Um, they're, um, this is the first week, they're going to have to uh, fill in a uh, chart on where to find all the help that they might need to access on Blackboard and like library and tutoring and the writing center and things like that. They're going to have to find it and then tell me where it is. And last but not least, questions and suggestions, comments. Well, I thank you all for being a wonderful audience. If there are no questions, we are going to end the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, Sephra had shared out in the chat a great and uh, some information um, about uh, this is an interesting study that was done regarding instructional video. Mm-hmm. That's really that was a really good study. I was going to put that on. There. Ah, yes. Thank you so much, Chat. I, I'm a terrible person on chat. No, you're fine. And then Crystalla talked about um, earlier feedback about including pictures and the question about how much is overwhelming. Mm-hmm. She talks about the pur- purpose of pictures is less about illustration and more about choking content. It's easier to get overwhelmed reading a 300 page book with pic- uh, it's easier Okay, Crystal, you want to explain what you have on here? Oh, there we go. She was saying it's easier to read a 300-page book with pictures rather than a 200-page thing without pictures. That's intimidating. (laughs) Yes, true. I was trying to scroll, and then other chats were taking the place of it. Thank you. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Very good. Um, Very good comments. All right. Very good comments. All right. I see someone asked about the slides being available. I don't know. Um, do do you make the slides available or not? I'll uh, I'll ask um, Brad Griffith to see. I think it could okay. certainly be available if you would like them to. Absolutely fine with me. Okay. Okay. All righty. I've got 1130. Um, Do you have 1130? I do. Thank you so much. This has been so great. Thank you. Great audience. Bye. Bye.